Ladies and gentlemen, Devio or Sajjano, a very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to this edition of the Manav Rajna Public Lecture Series. My name is Ajay Thomas and I'm the Director of the Faculty of Law at Manav Rajna University and I have the great honor of being the host for today for this uh, evening's lecture. So let me start off with a very brief and simple introduction to this lecture series. The Manav Rachna public lecture series is a platform where the university invites eminent people to speak on important social, cultural, and legal issues which are of topical and public interest. Our distinguished speakers in the past have included judges, leading lawyers, social workers, business leaders, and lawmakers. Our last lecture in the series was held a long time back in late 2019. So ladies and gentlemen, this lecture has been long overdue. This edition of the lecture is being hosted by the Faculty of Law and is the eighth in the series of lectures. The theme for today is the continuing relevance of fundamental duties in these COVID-19 times. This lecture, ladies and gentlemen, will give you an opportunity to appreciate the very important role that fundamental duties play in striking a balance between your individual freedoms and the larger interests of society. Our distinguished speaker for today's lecture, ladies and gentlemen, is somebody who I have had the great pleasure and honor of knowing for more than a decade. Mr. Gaurav Banerjee is a senior advocate practicing at the Supreme Court of India with an emphasis on commercial matters and in particular international arbitration. He's also a barrister with Sussex Court Chambers in, in London. Mr. Banerjee studied law at Cambridge University, securing a first class in the law tripos. He was awarded the Noah Hunter Dias Prize in law and was called to the bar in 1990 from Lincoln's Inn. He's been practicing law for a very, very long time, ladies and gentlemen, for almost 31 years, and was designated senior advocate at 36. Perhaps one of the youngest to have been designated at this young age. He is a former additional Solicitor General of India, having served the position with great distinction from 2009 until 2014. Mr. Banerjee is the Vice Chairman of the Ancitral National Coordination Committee for India and is also a national correspondent for India to Ancitral's cloud system. Now, before I invite Mr. Banerjee to deliver his lecture, let me take you all in the audience through a few housekeeping announcements. After Mr. Banerjee has spoken, there will be a window of 15 to 20 minutes where you will get an opportunity to put questions to Mr. Banerjee. And for this, what you need to do is use the questions box or the questions option, which is on the right hand side of your screen. Um, you need not wait till the end for the Q&A session to send your questions. You can do it at any point in time during the course of the lecture. So ladies and gentlemen, I now have the great honor to invite Mr. Banerjee to give us an insight into the continuing relevance of fundamental duties, especially during these extraordinary circumstances that we all find ourselves in. Mr. Banerjee, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Ajay. I hope I am uh, audible and visible. Uh, first, I would like to thank Manav Rachna University for giving me this opportunity to talk about something a little unusual. We always debate in public our various fundamental rights. Uh, you can ask virtually anybody on the street and they will come up with some of the various fundamental rights which are enshrined in our constitution, whether it is the right to life, whether it is the right to equality. But the moment you mention fundamental, fundamental duties, you draw a complete blank. Uh, and uh, there is a reason that I have picked this particular topic at this present moment. 
when i was ast uh, many many years ago some of you will recall the famous ram leela maidan incident where baba ramdev uh, was holding his yoga camp and then the delhi police intervened late at night and uh, removed various people from the ram leela maidan that case ultimately reached the supreme court and i uh, for a while was representing the delhi police and there i had my first brush as it were with uh, article 51a uh, and the fundamental duties chapter and i promptly forgot about it but then what something uh, very uh, interesting happened i had i have had the privilege of knowing justice chief justice lahoti over many years and we entered into this conversation about the constitution and certain forgotten areas of the constitution and incidentally chief justice lahoti is the uh, chairman of the advisory board of manav rachna university and he directed me towards this area of fundamental duties so uh, one more caveat i know there are a lot of uh, lawyers who are listening to this and there are a lot of non lawyers listening also uh, there this lecture will touch on various judgments so you will bear with me a little bit but i will try and make it interesting to all concerned with that can we now move on uh, uh, ajay to the very first slide and that's the topic if you could move on to the next one please uh, here you will see chief justice lahoti on the right and justice kt desai on the left uh, justice lahoti delivered a lecture called fundamental duties a forgotten chapter of the constitution um, and uh, justice kt desai is uh, was the second chief justice of uh, gujarat and every year there's a memorial lecture held in his honor in the bombay high court and i just wanted to mention what justice lahuti said about fundamental duties and i i'll just read out this quote i could not have chosen a subject better than fundamental duties more so when as a student of the constitution i find that in the judicial circles and amongst the citizens a significant provision like article 51a is found to be conspicuous more by its absence so true then he says it is a beautifully well drafted piece of constitutional enactment every word is so well chosen and placed as if in a gem studded necklace to me these ten duties sound like some some incantation in a holy book uh, beautiful words but the interesting thing is uh, the conversation that i had today with a close relative of mine i asked him can you name even one fundamental duty and he frankly confessed that the only fundamental duty that he knew in these times of covid was to lock yourself up and not meet anybody and wash his hands so the reality ladies and gentlemen is that none of us really have ever encountered any of these Ten duties. Now they are eleven, but I'll come back to that later. So uh, before I go to the actual text of the Constitution, I just wanted to give you a little bit of history, so you can understand where this all came from. Uh, can we move on, uh, please, to the next slide? So when the Constituent Assembly was debating fundamental rights, there was a subcommittee on fundamental rights. and uh, nobody really was focusing on fundamental duties except this gentleman who you see on the screen professor kt shah and when the report was submitted sometime in april 1947 this is what justice uh, professor kt shah uh, sorry kt shah had to say uh, when this report was uh, submitted and it's quite interesting he said less the talk of obligations sounds one sided i would add that corresponding to the rights of citizens there are also implied and declared obligations of the citizens 
there is i fear too much talk of rights everywhere and distressing silence in regards to duties in a modern society where the division of labor or specialization of functions is so widespread and complex where every individual is necessarily dependent on the cooperation of his fellows there cannot be rights only without any thought or mention of duties rights and duties must go hand in hand if we are to progress on the right lines though uh, professor kt shah uh, recorded this note of dissent the constituent assembly did not think it fit to have a chapter or any provision in the constitution originally for fundamental duties but this changed and this changed 26 years after that uh, maybe uh, go to the next slide please and it changed in a very interesting context as you can see on your screens the context was of course the famous or the infamous emergency and you can see there i believe that is george fernandes and that is when there was a rethink uh, if we could move on to the next slide uh, what happened was that the aicc set up a committee headed by this gentleman uh, sardar swaran singh and the idea was to amend the constitution um the infamous famous or infamous 42nd amendment and sardar swaran singh was the head of this 13 member committee and he submitted two reports the first report is uh, of course uh, available but he submitted a supplementary report interestingly i tried very hard to find a an authentic copy but i could not but what is interesting about this supplementary report is that they suggested eight <coughs> please note eight fundamental duties very different from what ultimately happened but just to give you a flavor i just mention what those eight fundamental duties were the first to respect and abide by the constitution and the laws second to uphold the sovereignty of the nation and function in such a way as to sustain and strengthen its unity and integrity the third respect the democratic institutions enshrined in the constitution not to do anything which may impair their dignity or authority four defend the country when the national service including military service when called upon to do so five abjure communalism in every form six render assistance and cooperation in the implementation of the directive principles of state policy promote the common good of the people so as to subserve the interests of social and economic justice seven abjure violence protect and safeguard public property and refrain from doing anything which may cause uh, undue destruction to such property and eight interestingly pay taxes according to law you will see from the eight that this was really in the context of the problems that the government thought they were facing which compelled them to take such harsh and authoritarian measures but this committee what is interesting about this committee is apart from formulating these eight duties this committee also recommended something quite draconian they said that if these duties were not complied with <clears throat> the parliament uh, sorry that they recommended that parliament should bring in a law by which if it was found that these duties were not complied with there would be harsh punishments and penalties and that such a law would could not be challenged in a court on the grounds of violation of fundamental rights so this was the proposal of the swaran singh committee uh, as we now know this proposal was not accepted there were some tweaks and particularly the last portion that there should be a penal provision was not accepted if we can now move on please to the next slide uh the picture you see before you is of the law minister <clears throat> at the time <coughs> uh, uh mr h r gokhale and he was tasked 
with piloting that famous bill or infamous bill, which was the 44th Amendment Bill, which ultimately resulted in the 42nd Amendment. And while he was speaking to the Lok Sabha and while he was presenting uh, the bill, he had some very interesting comments to make. And I would submit that those comments have some relevance even today. And I quote, it is absolutely wrong to underestimate the importance of such a formulation of duties for the people. Because when you have duties laid down, it becomes something which is vital to every citizen of India. And in the future, care should be taken to see that in all stages of our education, from the beginning to a later stage, these duties form part of our educational curriculum. It may be that the students are told, the children are told, what are the duties which the constitution envisages? It may be that such an education may be necessary, not only to children, but may be necessary even to grown up people because it is high time that they read those duties and understand what is the basic principle underlying these duties. So what uh, Mr. Gokhale was emphasizing was there has to be some communication and education to children and grown-ups as well. Sadly, uh, as we now know, that really has not happened. But be that as it may, with that little bit of historical background, may I now jump straight away into the 10, now 11 fundamental duties that form part of Article 51, Capital A of our Constitution. Uh, may I request, Ajay, that we move on to the next slide. So this is part Roman 4A, and it is important to know that these fundamental duties are the duties of a citizen, of every citizen of India. It is our duty, it is our uh, privilege to be citizens of this great country, and for that, we should have a corresponding obligation, and there are various uh, duties which have been prescri uh, prescribed. Uh, may, I move, uh, may I request you now to move on to the first such duty, uh, which you can now see on the screen. And it is very interesting. It, is, uh, uh, it says, to abide by the Constitution and respect its ideals and institutions, the national flag and the national anthem. Now you will see from this that we uh, it is a fundamental duty to respect the constitution's ideals. Now you will say that this is vague in the extreme. What do you mean by this? Uh, and obviously there is no definition. But the uh, but the uh, uh, Venkatachalaya committee in 2001, the committee which was set up, national committee on the working of the constitution seems to suggest that this, these ideals are enshrined in our preamble. And again, uh, the preamble is uh, one of the more neglected portions of the constitution, maybe not as neglected as fundamental duties. And I am sure all of you have at some point read the preamble, justice, social, economic, and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote them all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation, which we sort of roll off our tongues, but the reality is every word there is something to reflect on. So those are those ideas. What do you mean by respect its institutions? Of course, the institutions, the classical institutions are necessarily the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive. Then the, uh, the uh, fundamental duty enjoined upon us is to, res to respect your abide by the constitution and respect the national flag. Now, this is uh, something which is quite interesting. And if you could move on to the next slide, please. This is uh, this question, this article 511A was cited by the Supreme Court in the very famous judgment of Naveen Jindal versus Union of India. And here you see the building of uh, the general building with the national flag flag. And uh, as uh, the lawyers in the audience will know, uh, the case involved the right of a citizen to fly the national flag. 
uh, the government had something called the flag code and citizens were sort of prevented in some way from flying the national flag. Uh, the Supreme Court said, no, uh, you have a right to fly the national flag. And of course, uh, it is a right to be exercised uh, with responsibility. And what is interesting about this judgment and while you see the flag is that we in India do not subscribe to the US law in Texas versus Johnson. We are not, uh, we are not a nation which uh, in where it is legal to burn the national flag. We have to respect it. And with that respect, we can fly the flag. This uh, judgment of Chief Justice Kare specifically refers to Article 51, 1, uh, 51 A capital A. And uh, that's one place where it has been used. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you must fly the flag. Uh, it is part of our, in our sense, our fundamental duty to respect it. Uh, may I move on now to the next slide? Sorry, can we go back one, please? Uh, you will recall under 51AA, uh, we are to respect the national anthem. And this has been very, very controversial. Uh, if you see on your slide, school children standing up and uh, obviously the national anthem is being played. And there was a very interesting case long ago in, 19, in the 1980s where three young children uh, who were members of the Jehovah's Witnesses, they were asked to sing the national anthem. They stood up, but they did not sing the anthem. They said that they are forbidden to sing because their God does not permit them to sing in praise of anything or anybody other than their God. On this basis, the government expelled them from the school. They went to the Kerala High Court. The Kerala High Court dismissed their petition. The matter came to the Supreme Court. And this is that famous judgment of Bijoy Emanuel. And it was delivered by Justice Chinappa Reddy. And he ultimately held uh, that uh, they could not have been so expelled and the expulsion order was struck down. Uh, and in that judgment, he made a very interesting comment on Article 51 AA, which we are now looking at. And he said, and he drew a very fine line. He said, proper respect is shown to the national anthem by standing up when the national anthem is sung. It will not be right to say that disrespect is shown by not singing, by not joining in the singing. So this is the distinction he drew. And the judgment is also very interesting for the last sentence. And the last sentence is, our tradition, our tradition uh, promotes tolerance. Our philosophy promotes tolerance. Our constitution promotes tolerance. Let us not dilute. This was a very controversial judgment. The matter went up to a constitution bench. The constitution bench did not interfere. Justice Chinappa Reddy was heavily criticized for this. Uh, maybe move on to the next slide. Okay, now this issue of the flying, or, uh, sorry, of the singing of the national anthem again came into uh, the public limelight. All of you will remember sometime in 2016, November, when the Supreme Court passed an interim order in this case, where it made it compulsory for cinema halls to play the national anthem. And uh, and obviously people were expected to stand and sing. And cinema halls, it was made mandatory. What then happened was 
there were a lot of incidents where persons who did not sing or persons who sat down maybe for uh, maybe because they were physically handicapped or otherwise a lot of persons who did not join in the singing were heckled there were issues as to whether the national anthem could be compulsorily ordered to be sung the supreme court reconsidered the position in 2018 it modified the order it made it this it made it directory but still emphasized the thought in in the earlier judgment of Bijoy Emanuel that you must give the national anthem the appropriate respect by standing, of course, subject to people who could not stand. So, uh, Article 51 AA definitely has been the subject matter of some discussion, and it is for you to consider how you will respect our national flag and our national anthem. But it is a fundamental duty which is really for you to consider. And uh, I raise this because of the next slide. Can we come to the next slide? This is a gentleman by the name of Colin Kippany, who has become, uh, uh, who is an American football player, and who, when the national anthem was being played, of the, of the United States was being played, he did not stand to attention but he knelt down because he said that this is in protest uh, um, as regards the uh, treatment given to black people and people of color. This is what is now called taking the knee. Now, one interesting question, which uh, one, uh, and this was of course heavily criticized by the US president and, uh, and some others, and there was a divide, divided opinion on this. But the question that I ask you is whether uh, in the Indian context, will this action be contrary to our fundamental duty under 51 AA to respect the national anthem? And this is really an open question, particularly because of some of the observations of Justice Chinappa Reddy in his judgment in Vijayana. But this is an interesting question. And this is a question each of you will have to answer as per your own context. I go on to the next slide, which is 51AB. Please note there are 10, but the language of each of them are very interesting. So let's go to B. To cherish and follow the noble ideals which inspired our national struggle for freedom. Uh, I feel personally that the reality is that we just do not focus on this at all. We have, as a nation, of course, advanced from where we were in 1947. But we do need to reflect on these noble ideas. You may say to me, what is all this? What are these noble ideas? I mean, this is, again, very vague. Uh, the reality is those that who do not study history are condemned to repeat its faults. So let me try and uh, give you an ex give you a, in a sentence maybe, which is of course completely oversimplistic. What, for instance, the Venkatchalaya Commission thought of noble ideas, according to them, uh, and everybody will have a slightly different view on this. According to the National Commission, it is. Uh, According to the National Commission, the noble ideals are those which essentially uh, gave us freedom from foreign rule so that the people of India would have self-government, which would establish a society where there would be no exploitation of man by man, no poverty, no disease, no illiteracy. This is, of course, the National Commission's view. You may have a different view of the noble ideal, but whatever your view, at least let us not neglect them. Uh, may we now move on to the next slide. This is an easy one, uh, but it is very contextual because uh, uh, there is certainly a thinking amongst many that there is a an attack on the 
sovereignty, unity, and integrity of India. So if you are a citizen and you believe you are a citizen, then this is a natural duty. It's a natural obligation to uphold and protect the sovereignty, unity, and integrity of India. Uh, I would say this is a given, but how this is to be implemented again is for you, the audience, to think about. Maybe move on now to the next slide. D, to defend the country and render national service when called upon to do so. But this also is reflected in, in the uh, Fundamental Rights Chapter in Article 23.2. Uh, but interestingly, this uh, fundamental duty has been activated by the Supreme Court in a very peculiar way. Uh, and I'll explain it if we can go on to the next slide. This was in a case of Sorbo Nando Sonowal versus Union of India. You see the gentleman there, he is at present the Chief Minister of the State of Assam. But he had filed a case before the Supreme Court, uh, and uh, that case uh, was a challenge to an act which was called the Illegal Migrants uh, Detention, uh, sorry, Detection by Tribunals Act 1983, the IMDP Act which was struck down by the Supreme Court as contrary to Article 355. Uh, Justice Lahoti was part of that bench, it was Justice Marshall Chapman. And the reason this Article 51A B was invoked was to justify the locus standi of this gentleman to file the case before the Supreme Court under Article 32. The Supreme Court reasoned that it, since it is, it is not only the government's uh, duty to uphold, uh, to defend the country, the defense of the country is also, in a sense, the fundamental duty of citizens. And in challenging the IMDB Act, the Supreme Court reasoned that Mr. Sonowal was fulfilling this duty of his under 51 AD. Perhaps a bit of a stretch, but nevertheless, that is where it has been noted. But this is again, 51 AD is again a relatively uh, innocuous but important fundamental duty which every citizen should, uh, when called upon, should answer. In fact, some other countries have compulsory service. We do not. Article 23.2 provides for that option, which has never yet been exercised. Now, may we move on uh, to the Next slide, please. This is a particularly important one because I am particularly enamored of this particular fundamental duty. Uh, and I really feel that this is something that uh, is fundamental. And may I read it? To promote harmony and the spirit of common brotherhood amongst all the people of India transcending religious, linguistic, and regional or sectional diversities to renounce practices derogatory to the dignity of women. I would say this is one of the most important of the fundamental duties, particularly in the present scenario. And it has tremendous resonance the second portion, of course, also is of equal and fundamental importance. Please read this carefully. Please consider this carefully. And my humble request to all of you is to try to follow this to the extent you can. Uh, let me take each of those separately. May we move on now to the next slide. Now you will find from this slide a very peculiar two pictures. On the left, you will find the holy city of Rishikesh. And on the right, you will find some eggs. Now you will wonder what on earth do these two pictures have to do at all with what I have just read out to you. How is this relevant to promoting harmony and the spirit of common brotherhood amongst all the people of India? Well, 
the case which I mentioned on top, Om Prakash versus State of Uttar Pradesh, arose in these circumstances. What had happened is that the municipality had barred the selling of eggs in the holy cities of Rishikesh uh, and the nearby other two cities. And that was challenged. And while upholding those regulations, uh, this article was pressed into service by the Supreme Court. And the sentence that the judges used was quite interesting. All citizens are enjoined by the fundamental duties described in Article 51A to respect the, uh, the freedom of, the, of uh, the uh, freedom of each other and thereby promote harmony and the true spirit of common brotherhood in a pluralistic society. So 51 A E was pressed into survey to justify essentially the ban on the sale of eggs. Uh, maybe rightly, maybe wrongly, but it certainly shows that we have to learn to respect and promote harmony amongst each other in a pluralistic society. We should not be dogmatic, we should not be ultra-religious, ultra-regional, ultra-sectional. We must learn to live and let live. Uh, may I uh, proceed to the next slide, please? This, of course, is the second portion of 51 AE, to renounce practices derogatory to women. And this, of course, is the famous Vishakha case where the Supreme Court laid down guidelines uh, to uh, protect uh, working women from sexual harassment. And obviously, this is something that we really need to uh, endorse. We do need to renounce practices derogatory to women. Uh, it is one of our fundamental duties. We must learn to respect women in, in the way that we should. Uh, it's an important fundamental duty. I would urge you to consider this uh, with utmost seriousness. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide, please. This is in the context of the migrant crisis. This is particularly relevant to the COVID situation. This is a recent order passed by the Bombay bench at Oranga in a Suomotu petition uh, where uh, the, the pitiable condition of the migrants was being addressed. And in that order, uh, this, uh, the judge uh, who, who passed the order specifically referred to this article and specifically said, you know, this is a situation where we must follow guidelines and directions. We must preserve social and communal harmony. Uh, and we must remind ourselves that these are fundamental duties of our citizens. And particularly in the context of COVID, I would submit for your consideration, uh, all of us, all of us must look at 51 AE in a different, different sort of light and must consider what we can do to make sure that there is a spirit of uh, common brotherhood and uh, amongst uh, all the people. And let us not indulge in uh, hateful or divisive uh, use of the media uh, by whichever uh, faction. So this is an important order, and uh, I must bow my head to the uh, uh, Bombay High Court for really passing such a very, very detailed and well-reasoned order in April 2020. So uh, maybe move on now to the next uh, fundamental duty, please. F. Uh, this is a duty <clears throat> which is close to my heart because I am particularly interested in this. But this is a duty which I sadly feel 
is being neglected and it is to value and preserve the rich heritage of our composite culture. Please note the word composite. We have a heritage. That heritage is a beautiful composition like a patchwork quilt where we draw on so many different themes. You can see in the picture, you can see a temple, a gurdwara, a mosque, a church. We have so much built heritage. We have so much uh, spoken heritage. We have so much written heritage. We must value it and we must preserve it. Uh, in our drive to look forward, we should not lose the values and preserve the rich heritage of our composite past. Uh, this is something which is very close to my heart, uh, particularly uh, built heritage, monuments of the past, what different lessons they teach us. Uh, this is something we must please consider. Can we move on now to the next one? The next uh, slide. Uh, G. So we are now almost uh, uh, halfway through. We have uh, reached item seven, the seventh one. Uh, this also, is, this in fact uh, is one of the most cited articles in judgment uh, of the Supreme Court. And it is to protect and improve the natural environment. And you see the, the words which are used, including forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife. That's one part of it. And to have compassion for living creatures. How beautifully it has been put. I mean, the drafting, as Justice Lahuti said, is spectacularly good. Uh, the first portion, protect and improve the natural environment, has been the subject of a plethora of judgments, and I'm not going to bore you with all the citations. I'm just going to mention a couple, which, which are of uh, maybe one, which is really where it all, in some sense, started. So we move on to the next slide. Uh, this is a picture of the Dune Valley, just near Dehradun where illegal limestone mining was being conducted. And this is the very famous case, as lawyers will know, called Rural Litigation and Entitlement Kendra versus State of Uttar Pradesh, where these limestone quarries were ultimately closed down at the Supreme Court. And there the comment the Supreme Court made was, uh, and I quote, <clears throat> preservation of the environment and keeping the ecological balance unaffected is a task which is not only for governments, but also every citizen must undertake. It is a social obligation and let us remind every citizen that it is his fundamental duty as enshrined in Article 51A G of the Constitution. So the court, of course, interfered. They uh, wrapped the government on the knuckles, but reminded the citizen that it is also the citizen's duty. And this is what started off the entire flow of environmental litigation, the MC Mehta's, and there are a plethora of judgments which uh, almost as a mantra repeat Article 51 AG, and I'm not going to uh, 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 recite all those judgments, save and except to say that the importance that the courts give to it is something that we should also realize, we should also have and give the natural environment particular importance. Uh, maybe we we'll move on to the next slide, please. This is in re regard to the second portion of Article 51 AG, which is to have compassion for living creatures. And this came up in the in a in a case uh, where the state of Gujarat banned cow slaughter. And this matter then traveled the way up, up the ladder and ultimately ended up before seven judges in the case of state of Gujarat versus 
Mirzapur Moti Qureshi Kasab Jama, the uh, Mirzapur case, uh, where the judgment was written by Justice Lahoti, incidentally, and he emphasized that fundamental duties, uh, though they are not enforceable uh, by the writ of the court, would provide valuable guidance and an aid uh, to interpretation and um, and interpretation of constitutional and legal issues. So he used 51 AG to support his argument and his decision that this ban was legal. It was, of course, explained in the next judgment in the Koteva Sam judgment, where it was pointed out that fundamental duties cannot actually uh, invalidate uh, legislative policy in themselves. So that is explained further, but these are cases where this was cited. Another very interesting case where uh, this uh, Article 51 AG is cited in the context of compassion for living creatures is a case which you will see in the next slide. So this is the famous Jali Kuttu case where the Bullock cart uh, races of Tamil Nadu uh, were held to be illegal and contrary to the Prevention of Corruption Act, uh, sorry, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. And uh, uh, it was uh, at the instance of the Animal Welfare Board of India that uh, the Supreme Court intervened. They dismissed the review petition. But very interestingly, this case has now been referred to five judges. And uh, one of the questions framed by Justice Nariman while referring the question is, what is the scope of Article 51A, uh, G, uh, where, which talks about compassion for uh, living creatures. So we will see what happens, but as of now, uh, this is uh, the Jali Kuttu case where 51 AG has also been invoked. Uh, maybe move on to the next slide. So this is a very interesting uh, fundamental duty and uh, it is a, a, an injunction, a, a request to our us, the citizens of India to develop the scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. <clears throat> and you will see that I have put a silhouette of Pandit Nehru, because this aspect of scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform was in fact driven by him. And that is why I have chosen to put his uh, silhouette here, and uh, it has fallen for interpretation by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court seems to have understood the word humanism in a rather different manner from what I understood it. And perhaps the, uh, the previous generations understood humanism. Uh, humanism has been understood in a very different way. Uh, and the way it has been understood is, uh, will be clear in the next slide. Uh, so this is uh, a case of the AIMS student union uh, who uh, challenged the decision of the AIMS to have a uh, reservation uh, for postgraduate super speciality. And in this context, again, Justice uh, uh, Lahoti speaking, uh, said that, look, you, you have to uh, develop the scientific temper. You have to also uh, strive towards excellence, which is the next uh, fundamental duty. And in that, he used this uh, particular uh, fundamental duty to, to supplement his decision that you really cannot have reservations in the postgraduate super speciality category in, an, in a leading institute like AIMS, and that uh, that uh, reservation was struck down. Uh, and that is, of course, the famous AIMS student union case. You can see a picture of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, this uh, concept of 51 AH humanism has been explained. Uh, if we can now move on to the next slide, please. So this is uh, a hospital in Delhi, which many of you uh, may be uh, familiar with, 
uh, it is uh, the uh, Mulchan Hospital. And the case is Union of India versus Mulchan Therapy Ram uh, Trust. And the issue here was that uh, these uh, hospitals in Delhi had been given land on uh, concessional rates. And uh, their argument uh, was that they were not really required to treat the weaker section of society. This uh, challenge by them was successful in the High Court, but the Supreme Court said, no, the Supreme Court said, you must uh, have that requirement to, to treat the weaker members sections of society. And in that context, the word humanism, which uh, has a slightly perhaps different meaning uh, uh, in, in, in the historical context, was understood by the Supreme Court to mean humanity. And the Supreme Court then uh, referred to 51A uh, H and said that it would be inhuman to deny a person who is not having sufficient means or no means uh, life saving treatment simply on the ground that he is not having enough money. And on this basis, amongst other bases, the Supreme Court justified its decision that these hospitals must treat uh, the weaker sections of society. Uh, and that is how the word humanism has now been interpreted in 2018 in this and, and, a, and a following judgment. So uh, I would still say that in the Nehruvian sense, scientific temper of humanism and the, uh, uh, the uh, spirit of inquiry and reform is something we must inculcate, we must look forward, we must not get, uh, uh, must not get entangled in superstition we must look to science and to a rational inquiry and reform. Uh, we have a problem today of, of uh, rationalists being under attack. We must consider this as part of our duty under 51 AH. Uh, may we now move on to the next and uh, uh, next heading, which is I, which is pretty simple which is to safeguard public policy and to abjure violence. Uh, this is certainly something all of us can simply very easily do. Uh, the reason for having this as a fundamental duty, you must realize, is this is in the context of what was happening during the period of 1976. So that is why they brought this in. This has been invoked in that Ram Leela case in which I was uh, appearing for the Delhi police uh, briefly. And uh, Justice uh, Swatantra Kumar invoked it in a very interesting way. Uh, when he passed the final order, he said, look, no doubt uh, there may have been uh, failures on behalf of the police by, uh, by using uh, perhaps a little excessive force in evicting uh, citizens in the Ram Lila uh, And for that, of course, he indicated that some compensation was required to be paid by the police. But he said, there is a duty of the citizen also to safeguard public policy and to abjure violence. And on the basis of Article 51 AI, what he did was very interesting. He said that the trust should be was contributory negligent and the trust must pay 25% of the compensation. So this is uh, something very simply that he must Definitely all, and it's easy to, uh, to uh, comply with this fundamental duty. It's obvious and it is something very basic. I move on now to really the uh, last uh, original. And there you see, now you see the, and that, that's the context of the Ramlina Maidan incident. And that is uh, the Ramlina Maidan. And that is how this this uh, 51A uh, 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 51 AI has been now interpreted by the Topedia. Can we move on to the next slide, please? This is the one which I particularly like because I think this is one which we definitely, all of us must really focus on. Because this, in a sense, encompasses all the others. And this reminds me of that famous uh, 
poem of Rabindranath Tagore, uh, and you'll see why it's it's so beautifully put to strive towards excellence in all spheres of individual and collective activity, so that the nation constantly rises to higher levels of endeavor and achievement. Uh, and I think this really uh, is so uh, uh, nicely and beautifully put. It doesn't really require any explanation. Uh, I mean, it is uh, uh, it is something that we must all endeavor to uh, into that uh, heaven of freedom. Uh, let my country away, and it, it rings a bell for everybody. And this also has, uh, uh, as it were, appealed uh, to the Supreme Court. And could we move on to the next slide, please? So the first case where this was invoked was very interesting. Uh, you see that slide before you, Guru Kunj IA study circle. There was a uh, a way uh, a lot of uh, IAS aspirants or IFS aspirants. They would get into group A services, and then they would then try to get into the higher services while they were still in service and they would neglect their training. And to close this gap, the government amended the regulations and said, look, you can't completely ignore your training. If you want to do this, you jolly well resign and then, uh, then go ahead. And this was challenged. And while saying that this was perfectly uh, legitimate, the government's decision, this is what the Supreme Court said. In our view, the effort taken by the government in giving utmost importance to the training um, uh, of the selectees, training program of the selectees, so that uh, the higher services, being the topmost services of the country, is not wasted or does not become uh, useless, is in consonance with the purposes of Article 51 EJ. So, uh, the importance of training of the civil services was justified under 51 UJ by saying, look, training is necessary because of, uh, you must improve yourself and you must, uh, particularly in the service of the country, the topmost service of the country. So that is how the Supreme Court brought it 51 UJ and it brought it in, in another way as well. Uh, and if we could move on to the next slide, please. So this, if you see on the screen, uh, it might be a little difficult to identify are what is called the Padma Awards. There is the Bharat Ratna, there is the Padma Vibhushan, the Padma Vibhushan and the Padma Sri. And uh, there was a challenge. The, uh, the challenge to the government's handing out these national awards, it was challenged on the basis that under Article 18 of the Constitution, the government of India had abolished titles, and these were really in the nature of titles. The Supreme Court said, no, these are not in the nature of titles. And the Supreme Court said, it is necessary that there should be a system of awards and decorations in recognition to recognize excellence in the performance of duties under 51 AJ. So this is another way in which the court supported the view and exhorted us to, in a sense, excel ourselves, to try harder and harder and excel ourselves. And that is such a salutary fundamental duty, fundamental to our uh, everyday life and our life as citizens. And then we go on to the last one. This is a new fundamental duty, which has now been, so we have done with the the, the 10 that Justice Lahuti had commented on. And this is the new one, a parent or guardian to provide opportunities for education to his child, or as the case may be, his ward between the age of 6 and 14. So every one of us must, as a fundamental duty, educate our children, at least between the age of 6 and 14. This came in with the uh, Constitution Amendment. And of course, that is reflected in, in uh, other places as well. Uh, and it was brought in by the Amendment Act of 2002. And there you see a young man with a very heavy school bag. 
So these, uh, uh, my friends, are the 11 fundamental duties and each of them is so appropriately worded, each of them resonates <coughs> even today in the time of COVID. But the question that you will ask yourself, could we just move on to the next slide, please? The question that you'll ask yourself, all these duties are very, are all very well. But I mean, as a lawyer and as a citizen, I mean, how do you enforce these duties? What is, I mean, you have just told us that they are not enforceable in a court of law. So what is the use of these uh, very fancy words? And uh, if you see the uh, slide before you uh, on the question of enforceability, the gentleman on the right is, uh, was a former Chief Justice of India by the name of Justice Ranganath Mishra. And what he did was uh, that in the year 1998, this is exactly what he uh, raised uh, before the Supreme Court. He wrote a letter and that letter was treated as a public interest petition. And what he said was, you know, uh, what is the point of having all these wonderful uh, fundamental duties if they are not enforced. And he made some suggestions. And this case, ultimately, uh, you will re remember the Bijoy Emanuel uh, story of uh, uh, the national anthem. It got connected to that case and then, uh, and then uh, the uh, reference was returned and it was disposed of in 2003. Uh, and that's the judgment that I mentioned in the slide. So basically what the court said was said uh, was really it said this and no more. What it said is look, there is no obvious solution to implement it through the courts, but uh, they, they, there are some recommendations. There was a Justice J.S. Verma committee set up. There was a Venkat Chalaya committee set up, which is the National Commission for the uh, uh, to review the working of the constitution and that was set up if you could just move one slide further so this is justice venkat chalaya he headed this uh, national commission and uh, chief justice venkat chalaya uh, an incredibly erudite soft spoken uh, wonderful to juniors in court and uh, wish we had more judges like him and he chaired this uh, commission and the recommendation was essentially uh, uh, made there and uh, the government said they were considering it in 2001 and 2003 but nothing really has uh, has fructified and uh, the suggestions were really simple and i would suggest uh, that this be taken up and taken further because otherwise it will remain a, a forgotten chapter of our constitution one was organization of advocacy and sensitization programs, something like this, lectures, speeches. Two, display the text of 51A. I've got a one page printout of 51A. It, it is uh, something which is uh, very interesting as a read. It's a one pager uh, to, to display this text in government publications, in diaries, calendars, uh, maybe radio, maybe uh, video. Uh, maybe taught in schools, small booklets, it's not really, it's, it's very basic. Booklets in schools, in colleges, formal education, informal education, uh, citizens, we should be ready to take it up and, and uh, um, spread it. NGO, that was what was suggested. And really in this time, in this time of COVID, this is the ideal time when we are reflecting on our future and this is something we can consider it's it's a it's a, it's our duty it's a fundamental duty it's simple it's not difficult uh, it's it's an ideal uh, we, we can at least try to achieve it and on that note can we move, move on to the next slide please and this really is my penultimate slide and you will see there a silhouette of Mahatma Gandhi. And the reason I focus on him is that he 
of all people emphasize the importance of duties. And this is what he said. And I would like to essentially conclude with that thought so that you can really think about it. The true source of right is duty. If we all discharge our duties, rights will not be far to seek. If leaving duties unperformed, we run after rights, they will escape like the will of the wisp. The more we pursue them, the further they will fly. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Mahatma Gandhi, the father of our nation speaking. And on that note, could we come to my final slide, please? Thank you so much for your patience in listening to this very, very long exposition on fundamental duty. Okay. Uh, Mr. Banerjee, uh, am I audible? I'm just, I. Yes, you're audible. Yes, excellent. Um, I've had, I've run, as usual, I've run into some issues with, with the system. Uh, thankfully, it was only at the very end of uh, the lecture, as a result of which I'm being forced to join in through my mobile phone. And um, I must, on behalf of Malav Rashna University and the Faculty of Law, thank you for that excellent insight into um, the fundamental duties, reminding us that in addition to our rights, we do have a whole host of duties that we would need to abide by. And um, thank you again for making those slides, your, your presentation so interesting by giving us um you know giving us slides because i think slides makes a long lecture ever so interesting and uh, and that perhaps explains why we we still have um probably 95 percent of all our attendees still on the call so uh, so that's 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 a good record by any uh, by any uh, uh situation so we have a few questions now we have five to ten minutes for a short question and answer session um our first question is from shruti balakrishnan now shruti's question um is with respect to the recent dilution of the norms relating to environmental impact assessment eia she says that the dilution of the eia also appears to be in violation of 51 ag how are such issues handled when enacting legislations how can we as citizens hold the government accountable so this is shruti balakrishnan well um, i would agree with you shruti that there has been dilution of uh, environmental norms that is also my view um, unfortunately 51a will not help particularly because it is the duty of a citizen as opposed to the duty of a government and it is not really justiciable but certainly uh, there are other ways of uh, of achieving the same end by challenging such dilutions under the fundamental rights chapter and pressing in aid the uh, article 51 and there are a large number of judgments on 51 ag i've only mentioned one uh, which will support your uh, your thinking and uh, really uh, apart from the court i think what has to uh, lobby hard to try and uh, Stop this value, um, and I'm I'm fully with you. And if that as a citizen one could be of help, I'm I'm entirely and I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Banerjee. Uh, we now move on to a question from Shraddha Rajput. Um, she, her question is, what is the role of fundamental duties? in protecting the spirit of the constitution do fundamental duties have anything any role in protecting the the essential spirit of the constitution you know, uh, 
I, I would say that it does it, it does have a, I mean it may have a moral role in the sense that uh, the very first fundamental duty does enjoin citizens to uh, respect the ideals of the constitution and to that extent I would say I wouldn't say it protects the state but it certainly uh, as a, uh, it enjoins on you as a citizen as a moral obligation uh, sorry as as, a, as an individual obligation, maybe not implemented by the courts to uh, protect the spirit of the constitution, which would include the culture, which would include environment, which would include the ideas of the freedom movement. So yes, it, it, it may not have a direct bearing in a court, but it does uh, it does support the spirit of the constitution. Uh, we now move on to a question from Mr. Ashok Barimal. Um, Mr. Barimal's question is that, that he finds in the prison scenario, the most important duty of casting a vote in an election should have been included in Article 51A. So his question is, is there any particular reason as to why the legislature did not look or the parliament did not look into this aspect? So uh, you are right in the sense that this was one of the suggestions. I I, I, I can uh, immediately respond to that. If you look at the parliamentary debates in 1976, this was one of the suggestions that uh, there should be a fundamental duty while casting a vote, uh, fundamental duty to vote. But uh, the government then did not agree to it because uh, it's not clear from the debates as to why they did not agree to it, but if it is to be introduced, and I am, I agree that there should be a duty to cast a vote, uh, and it should be compulsory. Then, rather than introducing it in the fundamental duties chapter, it should be introduced in the, in the statute and somewhere in chapter. Uh, in, uh, not in chapter 4a because chapter 4a is not justiciable so even if you introduce it there you will not have any sanction of law by which you can continue there is oh. there, there is a proposal there's a lecture by justice uh, at Korean Joseph to increase the list of fundamental duty but nobody has ever no the government has not really revisited it after 1976 Uh, we have uh, another question, uh, Mr. Banerjee, if you could give me a minute. It is, uh, now this is a slightly controversial question put forth by Professor Preeti Saxena. Now, Professor Preeti Saxena is, co is quoting the great H.M. Uh, Servai, and um, she um, says that Mr. Servai was of the view that the duty under Article 51A-B simply does not make sense. So she's asking you for your uh, 51AB, which deals with the spirit of uh, the founding fathers and the national movement. Noble, idea. noble idea. The noble ideas. That's right. So she says so, that the great Mr. Sirvai was of the view that um, this simply didn't make any sense. In fact, I believe the the word used was ludicrous. So uh, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah. Be... Right. yes, Let please. Me... Uh, uh, Mr. Sirvai's general view on 51A was it was innocuous. He was of the view the entire chapter should be scrapped because there's no point in it. Uh, I would say that's a bit of a narrow view. That's a lawyer's view. That's a lawyer's view. This is a constitution not written only for lawyers. It is for citizens. Certainly, uh, noble ideas ideas is a uh, is not a well defined legal term. But we are not reading the constitution only as lawyers. We have to understand these are duties as citizens, and nobody can and. It is certainly up to a lawyer to say that noble ideas are ludicrous, but I as a citizen would say that noble ideas are not ideas are not ludicrous. They have they have great meaning today. 
in the context of today our freedom fighters struggles to be relevant and it is an it is a duty which is not enforced in a court so it does not happen that's my well i think uh, mr banerjee we've totally run out of time and uh, all what remains now is to um, to thank you once again for uh, for making this session this lecture so very interesting especially with those very illustrative slides um, and i think to to all the students in the audience we have uh, about uh, 50% of our audience are students and i think that was that was most insightful and most knowledgeable um and uh, on that note i'd also like to thank uh, the audience because at the end of the day without you my dear audience such lectures uh, make no sense so i i do appreciate the fact that uh, you have signed on and uh, you have taken the pains to be here until the very end so we truly appreciate your support to uh, this initiative by the faculty of law and the uh, and and the university that is madhav rashna so on that note ladies and gentlemen i i thank you all for being with us here today and uh, we look forward to seeing you at one of our future events um on the internet very soon thank you and have a very pleasant evening thank you everybody